Welcome to the Wednesday Night Bible Study. Uh, this is part two of a two-part series on seeking perfection, steps to becoming perfect. No part of this publication may be reproduced or retransmitted without the express written consent of Bethel Temple, Inc. of Chicago, which is under the leadership of our chief apostle, Dr. Yeho Kanabi Aman. The information that you are about to be presented is not independent of Bethel Temple, Inc. of Chicago or Dr. Aman, who through revelational research, which includes biblical hermeneutics, has discovered the ancient biblical principles that were once kept by the prophets of old and later by Christ in the New Testament. These same principles were taught to the disciples by the Messiah, who then commanded them to go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Uh, once again, we're going to have our two parts uh, of the Bible study. Part one is the lecture. All participants are muted. And part two will be uh, our question and answer session. When we get to the end to part two, you can press star six on your phone, star six on uh, your keypad if you are um, viewing the Bible study online. Our objective, uh, the focus of this week's study is to show believers that believers what they need to know and do in order to be perfect after having completed part one on the subject of perfection and recognizing that L requires his people to be perfect one of the next questions that should come to the forefront of the minds of believers is what must I do in order to be perfect and gain eternal life essentially this same question was asked to Yasha which is Jesus by a young man in Matthew, the 19th chapter, um, as well as Mark 10 and Luke, the 18th chapter, verse 18 through verse 22. So uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, bring Elder Avery uh, back on. What must I do in order to be perfect and gain eternal life? So that's what the Bible study is really going to be gained, uh, centered around today. Uh, we noticed or we read on last week a number of different Bible verses there were, that there were a number of different people who lived perfect. And so uh, we didn't show how they lived perfect, so we want to go ahead and address that today. So, Elder, what must individuals do uh, in order to be perfect and gain eternal life? Now, that's a very good question. And uh, if we allow the Bible to uh, give us an answer, um, having come to Yahshua, who is Jesus, and asking him what good thing he must do in order to have eternal life, Yahshua said the following things to the young man. And we find that in the book of Matthew, the 19th chapter, verses 16 to 21. Now, before I read it, I want to remind you that it's also found in the book of Mark and Luke as well. Mm -hmm. But it reads, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Now, of course, this person is asking what he must do to have eternal life, and we're, we're talking about perfection. So uh, when uh, he answers the question, you'll see that this is talking about perfection. And he said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is El, which is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, and the answer he gave is simply keep the commandments. Now that's the short answer. But uh, we're going to go through this study and, and give you a more in-depth answer that relates to uh, keeping the commandments. Mm -hmm. He says unto him, which? Now this young man is, he, he said, now, I, these commandments, I want to know which commandments you're talking about. And Yasha said, thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, if we examine the things that uh, he said to the young man, we can recognize these things as the uh, Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the young man said unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? 
Now, it's a very interesting thing that the young man said, I've done all of this. So uh, I want to know, if I want to know what I must do to have eternal life, then I should have it. Basically, it's what he's saying. But Yahshua said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect. So we see that he understood the young man's question to be asking, what do I need to do to be perfect? Mm Mm-hmm. So he said, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. So essentially what he was telling him is, yeah, perhaps you have kept the commandments, but you lack something. Right. Now, and, and some people will say, well, that's the only thing you have to do to be saved. But he would take the time to name all the commandments if you only had to do just one thing. Mm -hmm. This young man was lacking something in his keeping of the commandments. So that was all that he needed to do. Uh, In your case, you may be lacking two, three, or even five things. You need to keep all the commandments so that you won't be lacking anything, and that's the case that we're talking about. So although uh, Yasha, which is Jesus, gave this answer to the young man, Anyone who keeps the commandments can be perfect and have eternal life. However, believers must recognize that they must keep all of the commandments. And that's the point that's being made here in that particular verse. You can't keep one. You can't keep uh, most of them. You must keep them all in order to be perfect and enter into eternal life. Okay. And I have to go back, Elder, and read um, the other writers, Mark and Luke. If, and if I'm not mistaken, um, the the young man was well off. Um, yes. And if you read other writers, it didn't say that he had to sell everything because I think he was a wealthy person. He didn't have to sell no, everything, but he told him to sell some things. And essentially I believe what this Bible verse showed is that this person made that money or his wealth his God because he wouldn't get rid of a That's portion. the idea. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? So people may read this and say, well, what does selling what you have have to do with eternal life? But when you do certain things, you've made that thing a God. And you know that that's a commandment, that you should have no other gods before me. All well, right. sometimes people misunderstand. Uh, when they think of Ten Commandments, they're thinking rigidly of just ten things to do. Sure. But uh, anytime uh, you are told to do something or you're told not to do something, then you have a commandment. And one of the commandments then is for you to contribute to the poor. And this young man, he didn't. He had, uh, you know, wealth, and he was not contributing. You know, so uh, the Bible even tells us in regard to contribute to the necessity of the saints. So these are things we must remember when we're uh, trying to find out what we must do to have eternal life. We must do whatever the Bible told us to do. Okay. Excellent. And then we also have, uh, as you said, Mark, the 10th chapter, verse 17 through 21, and um, Luke, the 18th chapter, verse 18 through verse 22. Okay. Okay. So what must we do in order to reach perfection? Uh, Because the law of Yehovah, which is the Lord, is perfect. It converts the soul. Therefore, believers should meditate in it day and night. Psalms below gives a rationale for keeping the laws, and the statutes. I'm going to go ahead, Elder, and read uh, Psalms, the 19th chapter, verse 7 through verse 11. It says, the law of Jehovah is perfect. So this this goes out the window to anyone who says that we don't have to keep the law, because if something is perfect, you shouldn't, you don't do away with it. But it goes on to say, converting the soul. The testimony of Jehovah is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of Jehovah are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of Yehovah is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of Yehovah is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Yehovah are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. So not just any old gold, this is fine gold. Now we're talking about these things that belong to the Yehovah. Uh, Precious gold can't get you into the kingdom, but we're talking about eternal life. And so these things, all these things we must do to obtain eternal life, to reach perfection, more to be desired 
are they than gold? Yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. And in keeping of them, there is great reward. And so well, this is a great Bible right. verse um, that we uh, should keep the law, that we must keep the law in order to reach perfection. Uh, go ahead, Do you want to comment? No, I just wanted to comment that, and, and this is not the uh, topic that we're on today, sure. but people misunderstand this when they read another verse that said that the law made nothing perfect. Mm-hmm. Now, naturally, it's talking about two different laws. Sure. But if people are not well-versed in the Bible, they just simply say that every time the word law is mentioned, it's talking about the Ten Commandments. And, of course, that's not true. Okay. Uh, you can go ahead and take Romans seven twelve. This is one that we normally use uh, when people say, well, Paul went against the law. Well, this says otherwise. Well, th- th- what we're doing here is we're giving you from the Old Testament as well as the New Testament verses that gives you something about the character uh, or to understand the law itself. So it says, wherefore the law is holy, and the commandments holy, and just, and good. So we see from the Old Testament uh, how the law is being uh, praised as something that's perfect and right. We see in the New Testament uh, the same thing. And finally in Psalms, the first chapter, uh, verse 2, it says, But his delight is in the law of the Jehovah, which is the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. So our point here is that if you want to be perfect, not only should you just keep the commandments, but one thing to help assure that you will keep it is that you meditate in them day and night, that you think on it. Uh, You can't just look at it, say, okay, I'm going to do that, and then never look at it again. It's Mm -hmm. like a mirror. You look in the mirror, and you adjust your clothing if if it's not correct. Mm -hmm. But you are to look at the law, get an understanding, and adjust your life accordingly. And then you will learn how to reach perfection. Okay. And I just want to say when we say meditate, on a day and night, people want to say, well, what is the purpose of meditating to reach perfection? If you ever watch basketball games or football and you see people just, they're in that zone and they're thinking and they're talking, they're meditating. And in order to reach a thing, you think on it. I mean, anything that you do and you focus on it and it becomes a part of you, you're not just saying, okay, I got to remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. But if you continue to meditate on it, that's what gives you strength and gives you understanding. Those things that you've learned, those things that you've heard, the more you meditate on them, the more you think on them, the stronger you get. If you don't meditate on the thing, you won't get clear understanding because you're not running it through your mind. So this is why we must meditate. And, and the same thing goes for people that are doing evil. Uh, you see how that bank robbers meditate on the banks they're going to rob. Sure. They have to know, have their timing down correct. So anything that you want to do or accomplish, you should meditate on those things. That's excellent. That's an excellent thought. Okay. Uh, Let me go back here. I think, uh, yep, we still have some Bible verses, Psalm 63 and 3. Um, We have the 77th chapter of Psalm, verse 12. We have a number of different Bible verses here uh, that will help you in understanding uh, what we just went over here. What else must I do in order to uh, be perfect and gain eternal life, um, Elder? So uh, basically going from the the first question that was asked by the young man that we discussed in the beginning, part of being perfect is being approved by L. And, of course, L is God. Therefore, believers must study under the guidance of those who know the truth, those who have the experience. Uh, The Bible tells us to mark the perfect man and mark those who are perfect and upright. Uh, anytime an individual has a goal, he or she would do well to surround themselves by uh, like-minded individuals. Mm -hmm. So whatever it is you want to do, you want to be a doctor, you should surround yourself by people who want to be doctors and even by doctors themselves. Mm -hmm. So that would help you to stay like-minded and to reach your goal. In the book of 2 Timothy, the uh, second chapter in the 15th verse, The Bible commands you to study. And while we study, to show thyself approved unto El, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, 
rightly dividing the word of truth. And we always say when we read this verse, just like there's a right way to do it, there's a wrong way to do it. And that's why you study so that you can get an understanding and you study under guidance. Okay. And then we have uh, Acts, the eighth chapter and the 31st verse. Mm -hmm. It says, and he said, now, uh, when we read Acts, we find that there was a, a, a easy opening, a eunuch, and he was reading the Bible, but he didn't understand it. And right. this is part of the reason why we need to surround ourselves with people who understand and know what the Bible is talking about. Mm -hmm. So he asked the question, how can I, okay, uh, understand is basically what he was saying, except some man should guide me. You need guidance in your studying of the Bible because, there are verses that seem to contradict one another. So you need to uh, deal with individuals that understand the Bible's meaning, what it's saying, and then that will help you in your goal to reach perfection. And he desired Philip. And so in this case, it was Philip who uh, he used as a guide to help him that w um, <clears throat> so that he would come up and sit with him. So he desired Philip to do that, and of course, Philip obliged him and uh, came up to teach. Okay. And finally, again, I think I quoted this just a minute ago. In Mar uh, Psalms 37, 37, it says, Mark the perfect man. So this right away tells you that there is a perfect man to mark. And behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. So you don't want to hang around people that are not trying to be perfect. You need to hang around people who are uh, actively pursuing perfection or who are already perfect. And when you do that, it will help you be like-minded so that you can reach your goal. And it's so important that we do that. Um, it's easy. I mean, there are more people that's living unholy than there are, there are people that are living holy. And so it's easy to start. And you've seen people in the past. You've seen friends and you've seen other individuals who started hanging with a certain crowd. And after a while, you start seeing that they're becoming more like that crowd, even if they were completely different. And so, uh, you know, it, it's difficult for uh, individuals to find or mark the perfect man. There are more, like I said, there are more people that are in sin that are not keeping the commandments. And That's you're going right. to fall into that same trap. And so I know it's a difficult situation for um, some, but we have to press and we have to Make sure that we just kind of identify these people and keep company with them. That's all right. <clears throat> when we're looking at what else must I do in order to uh, be perfect and gain uh, eternal life, as we began to talk about Elder, and we talked about some on last week, um, the divine structure of the church is, is critical uh, for perfection. The divine structure of the church was established in order for believers to be made perfect. Okay, the structure was designed for believers to be made perfect. Therefore, you must be obedient unto those that have jurisdiction over you. Without this structure, and I know some people fight against this, but without this structure, which is the church, that is, the people cannot be perfect. Believers must, therefore, recognize that the office of the apostles has a chief, a chief apostle or uh, an overseer, if you will, for the word deceive as used below means to cause to accept as truth or valid that which is false or invalid to make someone believe something that is not true. And so uh, there are a lot of people that are deceivers. Uh, and as we went through our Bible studies in the past, we know how El reveals his secrets of salvation. And so we have to come under that structure. Uh, Eremi uh, Eremiah, um, Elder Jeremiah, the third chapter, verse 15. If you want to go ahead and read that. And yes. Uh, that. Before, before I say that, I want to uh, emphasize when you're talking about deceivers, some of the very people that you think will be able to help you are deceived themselves, and therefore they can't help but to deceive you. Sure. So uh, you need to – it's like when you go to the doctor. You need to understand something about your own case before you just fall under uh, the advice of a doctor because all doctors don't know everything. And if you have some idea about your condition, you can get a pretty good understanding of whether or not the doctor is leading you in the right direction. Okay. So at Jeremiah, you said, it says, and I will give you pastors. Now, if we read this in context, 
L is saying, I'll give you pastors. So he has to send you pastors. Just because there are pastors out there don't mean that they're of L. Sure. But the pastors that he sent, he said, according to my heart, they're going to be teaching the things that they can prove because he gave them to them and he told his people to prove all things. Okay? Which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And many times we get carried away because we we get mixed up with leaders who are very knowledgeable, and they can give you plenty of knowledge, but the understanding is lacking. And so we need leaders after his own heart who will give you both knowledge and understanding. And these things we're doing, remember, so that we might be perfect. So it takes a lot of seeking on the part of the believer right. to find those people that can uh, actually give you understanding. Okay. Uh, we use Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 11 through 14, and this is a, a great one for showing the structure, how it leads to perfection. It says, and he gave some apostles and some he gave. So these mm-hmm. people didn't set themselves up. He gave, this is L, some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for this is the reason the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ that this is why he gave them we went henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind and doctrine so if you don't have these this office set up everybody you're going to be listening to things and they all sound right and so you're going to keep going to and fro by everything that they're teaching, by the slate of men and cunning craftiness, okay, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So here, I mean, we see part of the perfection is, is not independent, or perfection is not independent of the structure of the church. Well, and, and we need people to understand that because we have some, some saints who live far away. The idea is as much as possible you need to uh, have that contact with the church because that entire structure, as he just read a few minutes ago, is set up for the perfection of the saints. And Mm -hmm. just being out on your own is difficult to live the perfect life that you may want to live by yourself. So you need that contact. That's why he gave apostles. That's why he gave those officials of the church for your perfection. So you need a guide, as uh, was said in the other book, because uh, you need to get understanding. And in the book of 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter and the 5th verse, uh, the Apostle Paul is speaking. He says, for I suppose I was not a wit behind the very chiefest apostle. So when we look at all these offices that he gave, the apostles being the top office, there is a chief among the apostles. So that chief was in charge of the church, okay? You can have a prophet, but there is a chief prophet, okay? Uh, Whenever you have anything that's structured, it's just like a school. There's a head teacher, okay? There's, There's people that are in charge of all the teachers. So we need to understand that it is likewise uh, in the church. When there's an office, there is a person who has the last word who is chief among all those officers that are called apostles. And when we uh, understand that, we'll find ourselves uh, going in the right direction. Finally, Jeremiah 23 and 4 says, and I will set up shepherds. Note every one of these verses that we're giving you, they show that L is doing it. He's setting up shepherds. These shepherds are the leaders or the overseers of the church over them which shall feed them and they shall fear no more nor be dismayed neither shall they be lacking saith Jehovah so the those teachers those leaders that are sin of them will make sure that you have everything that you need in order for you to lead a perfect life and that's why we need to uh, have someone that is knowledgeable that is sent by El in our life to help us stay on the straight and narrow. Okay. Excellent. Are there people and things um, that I should avoid in my endeavor to be perfect? I think uh, this, I mean, this really needs to be an area that's focused on. There are things that we should avoid in order to be perfect. 
sometimes we keep falling into the same trap because we don't know what to avoid. We keep running into those things. So let's look at a number of verses. We're going to go ahead and move on. So I think we have about five verses um, here, Elder. Proverbs 4.14 says, Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. Now, people may smile, and people may be real nice, but when we're talking about wicked, when you're doing anything that is anti-Bible, anti-commandments, the Bible says don't, don't, don't follow in that path. Don't go down that path. Um, don't be around people that are evil. Now, we think evil is we think about the just scary man or uh, folks that are just doing awful things like murder and just uh, crazy drugs. But, no, we're talking about people who are not walking in the path of righteousness. So um, we shouldn't enter in the path with them. That's all right. Uh, go ahead, Elder, Second Thessalonians 3.14. It says, and if any man obey not the word by this epistle, Note that man. Now, I want you to take notice of that man. But why are you taking notice? It says, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. When people do not accept the doctrine as it is given by El, you should not associate yourself with them. Because, you know what, when you do that, what happens is either you're going to rub off on them or they're going to rub off on you. It's going to be one way or the other. And, I mean, there are no exceptions, okay? Now, the idea is if you don't want to be saved, then you should hang around people that don't want to be saved. If you do want to be saved, what sense does it make for you to hang around people who don't want to be saved? Right. So, I mean, these are some general principles that just make common sense. Right. Um, I've seen people who were born uh, in the church, Dietary law, keeping everything. And now I see them eating all kind of stuff that I'm just shocked and amazed that their bodies can even ingest, you know, that kind of thing. But they hang around people that do that. That's okay. And little by little, they say, well, let me go ahead and try that. It can't be that bad. So, you know, we, we shouldn't hang around them and keep that type of company. Uh, Colossians, the second chapter, verse 8 says, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. You know, there are people who talk real good. They can philosophize till the cows come home. But their philosophy is not in line with the word of El. After the traditions of men, this is what the philosophers do. They're going to philosophize and give you this counsel after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So we have to be careful who we listen to. If it don't line up with the word of El, get out of Dodge. Okay. In Psalms, the first chapter and the first verse, it simply tells us, blessed is the man that walketh not, in other words, don't do this, in the counsel of the ungodly. Mm -hmm. Now, you want to get advice, you should get advice from people, from people who believe like you believe. Don't take advice from people who believe contrary to what you believe. Nor stand in the way of sinners. When we talk about a way, we're talking about a particular style that people have of living. If you don't believe in the way uh, that uh, you're supposed to live according to the Bible, don't hang around with people that don't believe that. Right. So, uh, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. We should not take all of our time to be involved with uh, socializing with individuals that do not accept the word of L. Okay. Now, there are going to be some times when you can't avoid that, but you should not socialize with them for the sake of socializing. Right. Now, in 2 Timothy 2 and 23, it says, But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gather gender stripes. People, when you are trying to live right, they're going to ask you all sorts of questions. And some of them are going to be so silly and, and uh, I mean, just out, outside the box. You don't entertain questions like that. Like people are going to tell you when you want to keep the Sabbath, well, how do you know that the days uh, weren't different uh, in the beginning? How do you know that the day wasn't a thousand-year day? I mean, these are questions that you don't need to entertain because when the Bible told you to keep the Sabbath, you know you can't keep a thousand-year day. So these are just some things we need to consider 
in our quest to be perfect, not to associate ourselves with or even call ourselves responding to those things. Okay. And then we have 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verse 9 and verse 11. It says, I wrote unto you in the epistle not to company with fornicators. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or uh, an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an uh, one no not to eat. So you become around, come around those kind of people and stay around them long enough. Either you're going to pull them. But the Bible is showing that this is a strong spirit, and they're going to pull on you even tougher than you pulling on them. So we okay. shouldn't even keep company with those type of people. That's all right. Yasha both spoke and ate with uh, publicans and sinners. Why can't I? So we are going to explain, Elder, what that is, that he sat with sinners, and he kept company with some sinners. So we need to go ahead and talk about that. Good, and it seems like the Bible is now contradicting itself because it tells you not to do this, but yet he did it, and we need to understand why he did it. Now, on a number of occasions, Yasha, with Jesus, sat eating and speaking with publicans and sinners. However, he was not doing so for the sake of socializing, but to win souls by calling sinners unto repentance. Only after individuals have learned the doctrine and become strong enough to resist temptation is it wise to do so. Now, if you're a new convert, you don't understand the Bible well, I would not advise doing what he did for you. But if you are strong in Jehovah and in the power of his might, you understand his will, and now you're going to witness you will go in those places around those individuals for the sake of winning souls. And you won't socialize just, oh, well, let's just go down and be buddy-buddy and sit on the lake just for the sake of sitting on the lake. And when we do such things, we'll find that uh, we'll have problems, and we, d we really don't want to have those type of problems when we are trying to live right as a new convert. And when we look at the book of Matthew, the ninth chapter in verse 11, it says, And when the Pharisees saw it, now they were looking at Yahshua himself, they said unto his disciples, Why is your master with publicans and sinners? Well, people who were uh, sinners, people who were business people, and who just simply were not interested in living right, uh, the Jews had a problem the Pharisees had a problem with you socializing with them. And I, I, what they did is they actually took it too far. Because if, if we were to follow their advice, no one would ever be saved because there would be no communi communication between you and those that need saving. Mm -hmm. uh, that's also in Mark and Luke, as you can see on the screen. Now, uh, in the book of Luke, the seventh chapter and the 34th verse, it says, the Son of Man is come eating and drinking. And ye say, behold, a gluttonous man and a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. Now, the value of this particular verse will allow us to understand that when you hang around certain people, guess what people who may not understand are going to think? They would call him a wine bibber because perhaps he hung around people who drank wine. They would call him a glutton simply because the people he hung around may have been gluttonous. But the point is, what is your purpose for going around them? And if you are weak, you should not be going around those type people. Right. Okay. And then we Finally, have to go ahead, Elder. And Luke the fifth chapter, verses thirty through thirty two. And Levi made a great feast in his own house. And there was a great company of publicans and of others that sat down with him. And many times when, you, when you're uh, witnessing and you're strong enough to do so, sinners are going to gather around you. But there's 
the, their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? Now, Yasser's response to them was, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Now, he recognized these people as sick because they needed saving, and, but they weren't saved, so he had to go to them to help them out. So he says, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So his, his reason for going around these individuals so that they could repent, see the errors of their ways, and convert. And that should be the reason why you go around people that do not believe the word. Okay. Great. Yasha both spoke and ate with publicans and sinners. Okay, so we're still um, talking about that. Um, as you said, and you were talking about, uh, Elder, I think you made it, some great points, that the problem with being in the presence uh, of sinners is that when believers and non-believers socialize with one another, either the believer is influenced by the ways of the non-believer or vice versa. When new converts attempt to witness to individuals held captive by sin, there's a tendency to return to the old habit that was influenced them. You know, there are some things that we've done for so many years, and we came out of sin and started walking in righteousness. Those things, some of those things still linger in us. So we shouldn't even entertain that. You know, we shouldn't get into that into that area. Uh, this is why those who are new to the faith should not attempt to witness without the support of someone strong. Some Jews went as far as to making it unlawful for a fellow Jew to keep company or to come unto anyone from another nation. This teaching was so widespread that Peter was caught up in this tradition until El, which is God, straightened him out on the subject. Uh, Elder, we have some Bible verses here that... Um, goes along with this, and so if you want to go ahead and read a couple of these, we can just move on. Well, Romans 15 and 1 makes a judgment, and it simply says that we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Uh, so that means when you find someone weak, you need to help them out, okay? And it's a good thing to pair up with someone that's strong if you're weak. In the 14th chapter and verses 1 through 2 and 3, it says, him that is weak, again, we're being offered some, uh, some guidance, some information that's quite helpful. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye. Now, it's talking to who? The strong. But not to doubtful disputation. Not, don't receive him just to argue with him or to have problems with him. For one believeth that he may eat all things. Now, of course, this is talking about all things that are right to eat. But there are cases where some people believe in being a vegetarian. Now, the Bible, if you look at it real careful, is using the word weak to refer to those individuals. And another person believes he may eat all things, so they might just eat meat. But there should be no debate between the two of you because one person wants to eat meat, the clean meat, and the other person wants to be a vegetarian. So it says, for one believes that he may eat all things. Another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For El has received him. And that last part, that last phrase saying that El has received him shows that El receives both of these individuals. So the things that they are doing are right. But it's just that one people, one person chose not to eat meat. The other person uh, chose to eat meat. And there right. should be no debate as long as the Bible condones both. Right. And then we have Acts 10, chapter verse 28. It says, And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. This is what you were talking about with Peter. Um, mm -hmm. This is what Peter was caught up into. But L has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So if you read the story in the book of Acts, the 10th chapter, there was a man who loved Yah, who was seeking after Yah, and he was not a Jew. But uh, El sent a Jew or Peter 
to him to go and to minister to him and his whole family so that they may be saved. So if we never came around people who were outside of the faith, then how are they going to get in the faith? How are they going to get strong? How are they going to learn right. the teaching? So um, we shouldn't separate ourselves from them that way. Um, but, again, to the socializing and being around them, you know, in certain faucets of our lives, we shouldn't do so. That's all right. Elder, does the New Testament suggest that we must keep the commandments anywhere else? Uh, that's a very good question because uh, the New Testament suggests that in a number of places. But uh, here we have, uh, it says the New Testament provides the reader with a number of reasons why the commandments should be kept. Furthermore, it declares in a number of different passages that those who, that you should keep the commandments. Now, uh, first of all, we talk about uh, you receiving whatsoever they ask. If you are a believer and you pray, they uh, will be able to receive the things that they request because they believe the word. And that's found in First John, the third chapter, and the 22nd verse. Mm -hmm. uh, also regarding the believers, it says that they dwell in him. In First John, the third chapter, verse 24, those who believe the word and, and study it are blessed and have a right to the tree of life. So in, in the idea of talking about perfection, these are the positive things that the Bible is telling you about those who keep the commandments and walk aright. That's found in Revelation 22 and 14. Uh, the Bible declares that those believers love the Son and is loved of the Father. So sometimes we, are, in our attempt to live right, we feel like, okay, is, does El really approve of me? Is, is, am I doing this right? Well, the Bible is making these statements about those of you who are striving to keep the commandments and, and walking in the ways that he told you. So in John 14, 21, it lets you know that the Father loves you. Okay? Uh, it says in 1 John 2 and 3 that you even know him. Now, those who don't keep the commandments or attempt to walk upright, they don't know him. I don't care how much they tell you they do. So, uh, again, these are the positive things that it says about the people. And it says that you abide in his love in John 15 and 10. So when we look at what the New Testament suggests in regard to the commandments, if you keep the commandments, these things are true of you. Okay. And we have a number of verses. I'm going to go through them relatively quick. We have these verses. Uh, we spoke about them on the left-hand side. It says, whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Whatsoever you ask, because we keep his commandments. So That's this, all right. This is the benefit of you keeping the commandments. He's going to give you what you ask of him. And we do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Uh, Revelation right. 22nd chapter, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they might have right to the tree of life. If you don't do the commandments, you won't have um, the right to the tree of life. And I want that right to the tree of life. We're talking about an eternal tree of life. That's and right. they enter in through the gates into the city. I'm pressing forward uh, towards that, Elder. And lastly, First John three twenty four, And he that keepeth the commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. So it is very, there are some great benefits to walking upright, um, to keeping the commandments, because this is going to put us in uh, a state of perfection. So the New Testament is verifying that keeping the commandment puts you on that road to perfection, and we must be perfect. Okay. What does the New Testament say about those who do not keep the commandments, Elder? Now, we talked about those that do. What about those that, that don't keep the commandments? Well, if we look at the flip side of the coin in relationship to what the New Testament says, the New Testament also provides the reader with a number of different passages passages describing those who do not, do not keep the commandments as those who, number one, they don't know the Son. Now, you might profess you know him, but if you don't keep his commandments, you really don't know him. The Bible is telling you this. It's not something I made up. If you don't keep the commandments, you don't have 
the love of El. Now, people, you'll see them always talking, I have the love of El, but they don't keep his commandment. Technically, what the Bible is saying, if you don't keep his commandment, you are a liar. You find that in 1 John, the second chapter, and the fourth verse. And finally, if you don't keep his commandments, you are worshiping in vain. So no matter how much you work, that's no wonder the Bible says that they're going to come to him and say, Lord, Lord, didn't I do this? And he's going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I know you not. So we have to keep the commandments. I don't care what the minister says early Sunday morning telling you we don't have to keep the law. We don't have to do what the Bible says. You need to get an understanding for yourself because the Bible is telling you this. Forget about what the minister says. Do you believe the minister more than you believe the Bible? Or do you believe the Bible? And that's what we have to remember. So in 1 John 2 and 4, it just said, He that says, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. I mean, that's just plain and simple. And the truth is not in him. So you want to call somebody wrong, call the Bible wrong and see what you receive for it. Okay, and then we have James one twenty five, but whosoever looketh intently into the perfect law that 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 gives freedom, I like that. This law it gives freedom and continues in it. So the law isn't done away with. We must continue in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it. So it's not hearers of the law that makes us perfect, but it's those that do the law. They will That's all right. Ask in what they do. That's all right. And then we have our Revelations uh, twenty one eight. And I'm going to go through that real quick. Uh, but that fearful and unbelieving and the abom abominable and murderers and whoremongers and scorners and idolaters and all liars have, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire brimstone, which is the second death. And then Mark 7, uh, 6 through 8, it, it basically, you can read that in your spare time. Um, it talks about the same thing. Uh, that the people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And so this is what we talked about earlier, uh, Elder, the deception and being deceived, that you continue to tell yourself, I know God, and he knows me, and he knows my heart, and I know the Son, and he knows me, and he knows my heart. And I worship God every week on Sunday, or you may say on the Sabbath, and I do all these things, but you are being deceived. Because that, while you're doing all, right. all these things, you are not keeping the commandments. And so this is when he gets to the part where he says, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So okay. uh, we must make sure that we don't, we, we brainwashing ourselves. We must do what's written and abide by it all. Uh, and you can play that game, he knows me all you want. The Bible says, keep my commandments and live. Yeah, that's what it said. Well, on the flip side of that is don't keep my commandments. And die. All right. I thought that the commandments were abolished. Does the New Testament suggest that we must keep the commandments anywhere else? Now, I know we're talking a lot about the law and the commandments, but we're, this is in relationship to uh, being perfect or living perfect. So, Elder, is it done well, away with? Is it abolished? Well, and, and that's what we need to understand as believers who want to be perfect. Now, although Moses received a law, and commandments, and I, and I want you to focus on that because people are just accustomed to saying that he received the Ten Commandments. It says here basically he received the law and commandments. Uh, Yehovah is is include is I'm sorry, the law of Yehovah includes statutes, and we talked about that earlier: judgments, ordinances, commandments, testimonies, and even charges. Now these things are are given to help you understand how to keep the Ten Commandments. I, I want to take a little time to say this. The Ten Commandments is a summary yes. of the law. Now, if you want to know how to keep the commandments, one, one of the parts says, uh, uh, thou shalt not kill. Then that part is telling you the things you must do towards your fellow man and understand. But you got to know when you kill, you can kill, kill a person verbally. Sure. And so you have to understand what the Bible is saying about that. The other part of the parts of the commandments is talking about how you are to uh, react and believe toward El. It says, uh, basically, it says, thou shalt have no other gods before him. 
the rich man had a God before him, even though he was not technically standing down there worshiping a a Buddhist God or some other God. His money became his God. So you can have a God in a number of different ways. But it is his statutes, judgments, and so forth that help you understand the meaning of the commandments. Mm -hmm. But it is often summarized as the Ten Commandments. Therefore, believers should not be confused by the fact that the apostles' doctrine was taught unto them by Meshachar. Now, the apostles' doctrine mentioned in Acts, the second chapter, verse 42, was taught to them by Meshachar. So, but why was it called the apostles' doctrine? Because they taught it. But Meshachar is the one that, what? Gave it to him because in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, he said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations whatsoever I have commanded you. So he's the one that gave them the commandments. Okay? But it became known as the Apostles' Doctrine because they were the ones that were teaching it. Now, since Mashika, and that word means Christ, declared that my doctrine is not mine. In other words, he didn't claim the doctrine as he is alone, but he is that sent me. In other words, my doctrine came from El, and I'm just summarizing this. So what did he mean? The law of Moses was received from El, and so it belongs to El. Uh, Meshachar being El in the body he is not pointing you toward the body. He's simply saying These, this is the law of El, and Moses received that law directly from El with the Ten Commandments written with his own finger. So when we look at the Bible, we're simply saying, don't get confused. Do I have to keep the law of Moses? Do I have to do this? Do I have to do what the apostles said? They're saying the same thing. You have to understand how they're saying the same thing. And one time, and I'll just be quiet after this, the law was summarized into two things. It says, uh, thou shalt love Jehovah thy El with all thy heart, thy soul and thy might. And then it gave a second commandment uh, in regard to uh, that. I forgot which one love that, that is. Neighbor. You love that and neighbor. love thy neighbor as thyself. So again, now it's divided into your duty toward El as well as your duty toward your fellow man. Uh -huh. So I can summarize it in two. I can summarize the law in ten. And guess what? I can even summarize it in one. Right. But the Bible says on these two hang on all the two. law. Mm-hmm. And the prophets. Mm -hmm. So we need to treat each other right as well as do what El commanded us to do. Okay. And uh, we have some Bible verses here. I'm going to just bring these up. Uh, and individuals at this time can go ahead and pause uh, this study to review uh, 1 Kings, the second chapter, verse 3. Uh, Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter, verse 3. And also Second Kings seventeen thirty seven, and so uh, we ask individuals to pause uh, the Bible study uh, at this time and, and read over these. We're not going to go over them at this time due to our time, uh, but these are some good Bible verses that we need to read and, and have in our, our pocket as well. All right, and you can see in that first verse that we gave at the top, it talks about the ways of El, the statutes, the commandments, the judgments, and so forth. So it wasn't just Ten commandments that Moses received. He received a, received a great deal more. And those things were given so that we would know how to love our neighbor as ourselves, how to love El with all our heart, our soul, and our might. Okay. I felt that the commandments were abolished. Does the New Testament suggest that we must keep the commandments uh, anywhere else? Um, and we, the, this is what we were talking about here previously, but the doctrine taught by the apostles throughout Jerusalem was given to them uh, via Meshachar, but it was referred to the apostles' doctrine because they taught it. Um, Acts, the first chapter, verse 2, says, Until the day in which uh, he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. All right. It's all right. Acts 2.42 and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Okay, this was after Meshachah had left the scene. They continued in it, and fellowship, and in breaking the bread, and in prayer. So the things that he taught the disciples, the things that he said that he didn't 
this wasn't a new doctrine he brought himself, but he brought that which is uh, sent by the Father. So we see that was a continuation of the law of Moses all the way from the Old Testament. To the That's Jewish. all right. He didn't make it up. No. And then they continued in that thing even after he had left off the saints. And then in Matthew, the 28th chapter, um, Elder talked about this. I'm not going to read it. You can read this again in your spare time where he commanded the disciples after he taught them to go and teach all nations uh, whatsoever he commanded. Uh, does it make sense that he taught his disciples, spent all these years with them, taught them, told them to go out and teach all nations, and then as soon as he was crucified and went and sat on the right hand of the Father, they should stop spreading the doctrine? Doesn't make sense. Okay. okay. And so we had to continue in that way. Um, Elder, I thought that the commandments were abolished. So we're going to see, does the New Testament suggest that we must keep uh, the commandments? Okay. And, and this, this is very important because we keep talking about perfection. You have to know that the commandments were not abolished. And if you know that, you can go about your business of keeping the commandments. Now, um, although Yasha declared, my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me, he condoned the law of Moses because it spoke of him. Now, that's one reason why he condoned it, and it came from El. So if the doc his doctrine of the Bible is saying that my doctrine is not mine, he's saying it belonged to El. That's where it came from. That's where it re originated at. Okay, and he's saying that in regard to his body. My doctrine is not mine referred to his body. It didn't come from this body just making it up. Now, but if we look in Luke, the 24th chapter, verse 27, verses 44 and 45, we'll see that he supported the law of Moses. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them, them being his disciples, in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. This, this just makes me so upset when people try to do away with the law, and the law is the only way that you can validate Mashiach's coming. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses. This is the second time he's mentioning Moses and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. So they all spoke of him. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Because these passages, they did not understand that they were talking about him in the beginning, but he opened their eyes, and they got an understanding. Okay. And then we have Exodus, the 32nd chapter, verse 15 uh, through 16, which tells us that, um, Moses uh, turned down and went from the mount and he had these tablets um, and they were written with the finger of El so uh, these commandments was given by El and as we've talked about in the past these commandments were put on the ark they were copies made they were given to those that were in leadership positions and when we get right. into the New Testament in Romans the third chapter said what advantage had the Jew much in every way but chiefly unto them were given the oracles of El. So these same writings that Moses had received in the Old Testament, it couldn't have been passed down verbally, and they still retained it. When you have the oracles of something, that means that you have the utterance, and those utterings were written down and passed down through generations. And this is what taught us how to be perfect. So this is what in Romans gave us, gives us the advantage. So we see that the commandments of or the law of Moses is something that we still must have in order to obtain perfection. That's all right. And people misunderstand. When they see the law of Moses, they think of something that Moses made up that was done away with. What Moses had, he got from El. And in that part of the verse down there at the bottom, it says, and the tables were the work of El. Moses didn't do it. Moses copied it later on. And the writing was the writing of El graving upon the tables. So the law of Moses came from El. It was not something that Moses just made up himself. And when we understand that, El does not do away with the things that he gives. Okay. And when we get that understanding, we'll know we must keep it in order to be perfect. 
Okay. We have just about two more slides left. Uh, we're going to continue on as far as the commandments were they abolished. Does the New Testament suggest that we must keep the commandments anywhere else? Um, 1 John, the fifth chapter, verse thing says, For this is the love of El, that we keep his commandments. So if you want his love, his unconditional love, we must keep his commandments. And his All commandments right. are not grievous. Uh, Elder John 14, 15. If you love me, I mean, this is the plea. It's in the Bible. Everybody reads it, but some people ignore it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, that's a simple statement. If you don't keep my commandments, it's evident that you don't love him. Mm -hmm. So we need to make up our mind that we're going to keep these commandments and be on that road to perfection. All right. Because that's what the commandments were given for. And this is why we talked about the structure of the church, Elder. You know how many people um, I've spoken with, and they said, well, I believe you have to keep the commandments. There's only two commandments, to love the God, like God, love God with all your heart, and to love your neighbors. Those and they get confused. <laughs> they get confused. They don't recognize that that's a summary of the law. Sure. So you still got to keep the whole law, mm -hmm. okay? And there's so many ways you can summarize it mm -hmm. because as a whole, it's telling you what do you do toward L. And what do you do toward man? Mm -hmm. And when you get both of those in there, that means you have to keep the whole law. Okay. <laughs> All right. We can also look at Mark the 10th chapter, verse 19, as well as Luke the 18th chapter, verse 18 through 22. Does the Old Testament suggest that we must keep the commandments, Elder? Well, basically like the New Testament, the Old Testament promised blessings for those who keep the commandments. And curses for those who do not. Therefore, it admonished believers to keep the law. Now, we can't get any plainer than that. As a matter of fact, the New Testament church received their teachings from the Old Testament. Moses was careful to encourage believers to keep all the law and the commandments which he received. The law of Moses included statutes, and we said this before, judgments, ordinances, charges, testimonies, and etc. And many of these were given as an explanation of how to perform all the law and commandments. Okay. And so we have these Bible verses here um, on the right. Uh, Elder, if you want to pick one, I'm going to bring them all up so individuals can stop the recording at this time and, and look over these Bible verses, um, but I think we have about four of them. Uh, is there anyone that you want to grab a hold to or you want to sum up uh, what these verses are saying as I bring them up? Well, if we look at the one at the bottom, Deuteronomy 13 and 18, it says, When thou shalt hearken to the voice of Jehovah thy El, to keep all, and I want to focus on that word, all, because it doesn't help you to keep part of it to keep all his commandments, which I command thee this day, to do that which is right in the eyes of your whole. His commandments are right. Why do you judge them as wrong? Mm -hmm. If you don't keep them, that's what you're doing. You're judging the commandments as being wrong. And that's why so many people say that the law has been abolished. Shame on you for not being able to read. <laughs> okay. And again, this is leading to perfection. Uh, we have a number of Bible verses here. Uh, I just want to leave that up for a few seconds here at the bottom. Uh, individuals can uh, pause the recording at this time. Again, look at those Bible verses. And we have to take the time to uh, go, and this is an hour. We have a lot of Bible verses. And this one hour uh, Bible study, you can go over it for four or five hours. Um, three yes. or four slides at a time and just really get into the Bible verses and read what we're saying or listen to what we're talking about and read the Bible verses and pull those things that we're talking about out of the verses. And this is how we meditate That's on all this right. word and this is how we understand this word. And I would challenge you to do just that because it's your soul. You're going to have to make sure that you're moving in the right direction. So don't accept it just because I said it. Believe the word. So make sure you read it and understand it. Okay. And this is our last, uh, I believe our last slide here, uh, Elder. Although I want to live perfect, I get confused. 
weren't the commandments of Christ uh, different from that which is uh, of the law of Moses? Okay, and we can move through this rather quickly because we really answered that question. Uh, the commandments of Mashiach, which is Christ, were not different from the law of Moses. And sometimes they seem to have been different when the law of Moses is summarized into the Ten Commandments. Well, there was more than just Ten Commandments, but the Ten Commandments, again, is a summary. And when we recognize that it's a summary of the law, then we'll know that you must keep it. Uh, Mashikov said, and this verse is not there, but I want to uh, say it because it's it's so uh, right. In the book of Matthew, the fifth chapter, think not that I come to destroy the law. So he didn't come to destroy the law of Moses. Why are you trying to destroy it? Mm. I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And the word fulfill means to do. And he followed the law as our example. Then so should we. We should do what the law says. So if one place is talking about Moses received from El a law and commandment, and another person another place in the Old Testament and the New Testament says Ten Commandments, and one place you find says two commandments, and then you may even see it summarized in some places as one commandment, then we know we must keep the whole law. Or as one writer, eat the whole rope. If you do like the Bible said do, you can't go wrong. Okay. That was excellent. Um, well, we're at the end. We're going to open it up in case we have any questions. Uh, Elder, I think that it's important. Uh, this is a, a great uh, Bible study, and I think that it's important for uh, individuals to get a clear understanding on how we should um, – obtain perfection, the things we should do, and also encourage individuals that it's a constant push. Um, so some people, this walk is easy. Um, okay. Some people it's easy, but we go through our struggles. And so we don't want to wrestle with people, and we don't want to have that camaraderie and talk to individuals. People need you. As much as I teach and as much as I minister to folks, I need the encouragement. I need uh those saints talking to me uh, because I go through. And so we all go through. uh, And so we just have to remember that this is a constant battle. It's a constant walk, but it's achievable. And it's all right. If you don't surround, if you don't put yourself in the right environment, it's going to be 10 times uh, more difficult and you might not achieve perfection. And so Mm -hmm. we have to just make sure that we, uh, do these Bible studies and then we listen to the word and it gives us strength and it encourages us uh, to let us know that we can make it. So I think that this was a uh, a very uh, good two part series and that we show that it's possible to be perfect and um, to also show that the things that we must do in order to obtain perfection, we must come on to those uh, individuals who have the knowledge and understanding and um, they're going to teach us how to walk upright. That's why he gave some apostles and some prophets. There are some people who don't get an opportunity to talk to the chief. You know, or, or that's all right. That's over. And so there are people who are set up like us who do these kind of studies. And then there are other people that go out and may go out to visit the people who hear us. You know, and so it, it's a it's a big collaboration. But we have to just continue to press forward and uh, achieve because this is the only way to eternal life. And I think we have to get that to our head. So, and it's a very good start. There are many, many more verses that will point to the idea that you must keep the commandment, that being that walking upright and perfect is an achievable goal, and that when we learn those things, we can learn who the false prophet is, who's not telling the whole truth, and who is being deceitful. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. <laughs> All right. And, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, I'm glad for Mashiach, which is Christ. I'm glad that he came. You know, the Bible said that he was made a little lower than the angels and that he was tempted mm-hmm. in all things. So keep pushing, keep pushing. Keep, if you fall, I, that's my only keep pushing. He knows the temptations. He's been tempted in all ways. He knows the things that we go it's through. All right. And he understands. But. You know, you have to make a conscious effort to change. You have to make a conscious effort to walk upright. 
And if you just keep talking to them and keep praying and keep talking to the saints, um, you know, L will give you that extra strength. Because there are some things, L, that I have to admit that without him, I won't be All able right. to do it. I okay. won't be able to get over some things, you know, in my life without him. And so um, I, I, I thank L for the son because the son has the compassion. The son understands the creation. And so, um, you know, that's my only advice to anybody who may be listening um, here in the future that we have to continue to press forward and find out how to live um, holy. And the only way that you're going to find out is coming under that structure, which he set up. That's all right. Beautiful. All right. So uh, star six, if we don't have any questions, um, we are going to uh, go ahead and get ready to uh, dismiss. We're going to have our Bible studies uploaded. There's a lot of people, and I do apologize. There was a, a, a moon service on tonight, so a lot of individuals did not make it to the Bible study, but this is recorded. It'll be on our YouTube uh, channel as well as TV Bethel uh, later on tonight. If you have any questions now or in the future, we ask that you uh, send those questions to Bible study at Bethel.net, and Elder Ebrey and myself will um, answer those questions, and we'll get back with you um, in an appropriate time. Uh, for those individuals that may be joining us for the first time or looking at these Bible studies in the future, um, we ask that you uh, go to our website, learn more about us, www.tvbaythel.net. We have a, tons of information, a lot of our podcasts and our Bible studies, and you can just find out um, a lot about us. And we definitely want you to become a member of us and study with us online and um, view our upcoming streams that we're working on currently. Then you can get more information by going to www.tvbaythel.net. Uh, for those that will be in the Chicagoland area, we uh, encourage you or we offer our extend our hand for you to join us in our Pentecost service uh, that will be on June 1st. I believe that's th this Sunday at 8 p.m. It is our Holy Convocation. For more information, we ask that you contact myself, Minister Al, at 312-273-4068 or send an email to us at Pentecost2014 at Bethel.net. So um, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, Elder, anything else before we close out? No, I'm thoroughly satisfied. Okay, and um, we look forward to seeing you this Sabbath. We look forward to seeing you next Wednesday, 8 p.m. Central Sharp for our Wednesday night Bible study. Shalom. Shalom.